It is here you'll find economists are not only a very myopic group, but a very timid group as well. And the radical idea that sex is the primary driver of economic growth is just too, well, sexy for them. However, just because an idea is radical doesn't mean it isn't correct or true. Matter of fact, while economists, politicians, academics, and feminists are clutching their pearls over the concept that sex powers our economy, there's a street-smart, common-sense American blue-collar Joe who's yelling, You needed a study for that? But this presents a problem, not only for economists, but all of society, and especially women. Because if sex, which also includes love, family, and children slash progeny, is the primary motivator for men to maximize their economic production, no amount of government spending, monetary policy, stimulus checks, or any other economic measures are going to prompt men to produce. The responsibility of motivating men to be economically productive falls solely into the hands of women. And when you consider what would be required of women to fire up men's economic engines once again, you can see where such a sex-based economic policy might run into some issues. A most politically incorrect fiscal policy. It helps to view men as the engines of economic production and women as the fuel they run on. Because just like any other engine, men require a certain quality or octane level of fuel or they simply won't run. And though today's highly fragile society is appalled by men's desires and the fact that men dare to have them, it has never been a secret what men want. They want 1. Physical youth and beauty. Not an obese, disgusting pig. Not a woman who has mutilated her face or body with an absurd amount of piercings or tattoos. Not some idiot who dyes her hair dumbass colors. And not an old woman who has lost all her beauty. Men are only attracted to younger, beautiful, shapely, feminine women. Period. 2. A sweet and kind demeanor. Commonsensically, men like nice girls. Sweet girls. Girls whose company is a positive, pleasant experience, not a taxing or lessening one. This doesn't mean she's an obedient doormat slave, but a woman who doesn't nag, is not combative, and is someone you genuinely enjoy being around. 3. A willingness and enjoyment of sex. Men demand sex. For many women, this is upsetting, but no man is going to maximize his production unless he's getting laid. And not only does he require sex, but he requires a woman who enjoys having sex with him. As the obligatory chore-like sex most married people have today is demoralizing, as it shows most women don't like their men. For a willingness and desire to hang out with him. Men like women who like them in return. The last thing a man wants to do is burden an uninterested woman with his unwanted presence. Men want women to voluntarily and enthusiastically hang out with them, as it shows these women genuinely like them. It's just better for everyone when the girl likes you back. The above four traits alone will make a man very interested and attracted to a woman. They will also fire up his economic engines infinitely more than a disability check or Adderall prescription ever could. But throw on the added qualities below, and he'll be incentivized even more, as they are the qualities that make for a good wife and mother, which is the foundation of any successful family. 5. A good mother to his children. Men, good men anyway, want their children to be raised by a caring, loving mother. Not a girl boss who ditches her kids at daycare as she gets her MBA. Not a soulless corporate HR Karen who outsources her children to the schools. An actual mother who is there to love, take care of, and raise the children because she loves her children more than herself. 6. No other man's children. Women today are purposely obtuse playing dumb that they didn't know having another man's child is the single worst thing they could do to their love life. 
Still, this doesn't change the hardwired genetic revulsion men have to women with other men's children. Society may celebrate single moms as saints and rock stars, but behind closed doors, there is literally nothing worse you could do to demotivate men from working, as their labor now goes to support another man's genetics, not his. 7. Loyalty Especially today, the value of a woman who happily commits to a man and doesn't constantly look to upgrade is immeasurable. The peace and calm that comes knowing your wife is committed to you and isn't tempted by the latest office employee is critical to a successful marriage and enjoyable life. But this says nothing of avoiding the maddening experience of when your woman, married or not, subtly and cowardly sabotages your relationship to provide the rationale to end it so she may pursue another, an experience every man has had whether he realizes it or not. Regardless of the scenario, loyalty avoids these nightmare situations and provides men the reason to work hard and counter-invest in their women. 8. Won't Divorce Him The established record of Western women flippantly divorcing their husbands, tossing away their vows, and destroying families in the process is easily the single biggest deterrent to men becoming engines of economic growth. Consequently, this makes divorce the single biggest destroyer of potential wealth and is often the reason we can't have nice things. Divorce is such a huge and likely threat. Men aren't just avoiding marriage, but they are scaling back their production to reflect that. Working only enough to support one person in the here and now as opposed to a family for a lifetime. Committing to a man and honoring your wedding vows turns men from part-time, temporary workers to lifelong, dedicated employees. If you take these eight traits and put them into one woman, it's the equivalent of putting 120-octane racing fuel in your engine. And not the racing fuel F1 racers use, but the super-powerful drag racing engines that regularly achieve over 330 miles an hour. Your GDP would explode overnight, and in a decade, all our financial problems would be solved. But women don't even need to go eight for eight, let alone hit every one of them out of the park to get the economy humming again. A woman who is simply not fat, doesn't have another man's kids, has a kind demeanor, enjoys sex, likes fun, and doesn't sleep around, is still a premium 91-octane fuel that would turn a basement-dwelling incel into a gainfully-employed accountant. But if you look at the fuel women have become today, it can hardly be called fuel. It's more like a 37-octane sludge. Not only can engines not run on it, but it will destroy your engines if you use it. 60% of marrying-age women are overweight, removing the immediate reason men would have interest in them. 80% of college-educated women have unemployable degrees and the student debt that comes with it, making them a financial liability on the very first date. 65% of young women vote Democrat, making life an even steeper uphill battle financially. 40% of marrying-age women already have another man's kid in tow, repulsing men even further. At a minimum, 25% of marrying-age women have an incurable STD. Over one in four women are on some kind of psychotropic medhead drug, the percent of which increases as they age and doesn't account for the illicit drugs they're on. And this says nothing about the high and increasing percent of women who mutilate their bodies with excessive tattoos, piercings, and idiotic hair colors. And if this wasn't enough to kill the communal sex drive of men everywhere, men still face a 45% chance of getting divorced, 75% of the time, it being initiated by the woman. Not to be too harsh on women, and to be honest, the exact same thing could be said of today's modern soy boy men. But this isn't fuel. This is piss. There's one final thing that needs to be noted about the feasibility of using sex, and family, love, children, etc., to boost economic growth and enrich us as a society. And that is... All of this assumes women would agree to this, that women, for whatever noble reason, would drop what they're doing now 
change their lives, live their lives for men, becoming what men wanted and not what they wanted, all out of a selfless and charitable desire to boost economic production and increase society's wealth, which is simply not the case. At first glance, many people may view women's choices to become single moms, earn worthless college degrees, dye their hair blue, get fat, etc., as stupid and naive. But knowing what we know about women's general disinterest in men, their life choices are not stupid, but are simply the life choices they want to make because they no longer have to care about what men want. These are the lives they want to lead. When women say they're liberated from men, they're not joking or trying to be edgy. Women really never liked men that much in the first place. And now that they don't need men, their life choices reflect that. If women wanted men, they would be thin. If women wanted men, they would wear dresses. If women wanted men, they would be nice. The simple reality is they don't. Further corroborating their actions is their words. Though it's been said a thousand times before in this book, it cannot be emphasized enough that they literally tell you they don't need men. Be it the movies, commercials, music, books, dating apps, universities, government, politicians, second grade school teachers, female family members, even from their own lips, the message they don't want men is consistent and clear. Polling data shows, depending on age, young women rank men between 4th and 7th in life priorities. A study titled The Rise of the She Economy estimates by 2030 half of marrying age women will never be married or have kids, choosing a career and single life instead. And if none of this convinces you, young women today go so far as to regulate and shame women within their social groups for wanting to have a man in their lives. Calling women who want men pick Mishas and often putting them on double secret probation, dare a young woman confess her desire to be a stay-at-home mom. Certainly, out of a population of 160 million American women, there are some who desire a traditional June Cleaver life. But the vast, vast majority of women have absolutely no interest in becoming what men want, rendering any sex-based economic strategy neutered and moot.